What's up, everyone? Welcome to the SG BitCast. This is episode 21, and today we're going to be talking about a whole lot of news that happened this week uh, surrounding Fortnite, PUBG, the Nintendo Direct announcements, uh, Black Ops 4, the Division 2. In short, there was an awful lot that happened this week, and we're going to be talking about all of it. So I'll be your host, Ains. I'm joined by Bert, as usual, and we're going to get things started by uh, touching on the Nintendo Direct. So Nintendo Direct happened a couple days ago. Um, it kind of laid out the plan for 2018 for the Nintendo Switch and confirmed some things that fans had been hoping for. So that includes uh, new Smash Brothers, which was confirmed to be coming in 2018 for the Switch. And that was probably the biggest uh, new announcement that uh, fans were hoping to see. We're also going to be getting Mario, Mario Tennis Aces in June, Octopath Traveler in July, and a whole lot of ports ports and more ports, which we kind of expected given the uh, success of third-party titles on the platform, but uh, it was uh, rather surprising to see that many ports lined up. So, happy Mario Day! <laughs> no. no, it's uh, March 10th for people it's, that have no is idea. That, is that Marten Day? Is that what that is? That's uh, Marten Day. <laughs> people that aren't in the Nintendo world, today's March 10th and the Nintendo fan base has turned that into Mario Day. So, happy Mario Day and... Um, all that good stuff regarding that. If you watch Nintendo Direct, it was very interesting. However, a lot of people were kind of let down by the repetition and the number of ports continuing to release. So um, I'm kind of somewhere in the middle. I'm excited for some new releases of uh, Nintendo games, but I'm not excited at the continuing port release or cannibalism of the Wii U games. So thought to say about that one. <laughs> so let's talk about a few of those. So uh, Smash Brothers, they showed that... Um, you know, the Inklings or the Splatoon characters are going to be joining the lineup there. They didn't really, you know, show a whole lot otherwise, but I saw kind of the internet go ablaze with that confirmation, and we know that's a big title for them. Um, Mario Tennis Aces, you know, I love tennis games. I know you feel the same, Bert. I hope that this has kind of a sense of realism when it comes to the physics. You know, I, I did see they said that you can kind of turn off all the superpowers and abilities and play more of a straight tennis game so that'll be interesting if that's done well i hope it is and then i think the one that i'm most excited for honestly is octopath traveler um they uh announced a uh, wayfarers edition which is a hundred dollar collector's edition which i thought was pretty neat as typical you and i both have it pre-ordered already uh but that's coming in july that's actually sooner than i thought it was going to come so why don't we kick off with those kind of three more new releases yeah, so I'm kind of with you. Uh, Project Octopath Tra uh, Traveler is probably my favorite demo that I've played in a while. I did enjoy it quite a bit, and um, when I saw that, like, what is it, a special edition slash collector's edition, I was pretty excited to see that. I was hoping they would do that. That's the thing I'm most excited about. Um, the Mario Tennis thing, I think they can only do better after we played that last one that was just really, really poor. Um, I actually had it, and I, I took the game back because it was so bad. I thought it would be a fun party game. And it did not deliver in that whatsoever. So I, I took it back to GameStop because I had bought it used. So that's kind of one of the um, kind of a letdowns. But I am hoping to see that the Super Smash Brothers thing, and that happened towards the end. Um, it looks, I guess, like it's going to be a new game. I hope it's going to be an entirely new game and not the Wii U port with simply the Splatoon characters added to it. That would be really unfortunate if that happened. But um, I think we all kind of expected a Super Smash. I think we've had a couple videos so far where we talked about the new games that are coming to the Switch that are gonna be new, and Super Smash has been on everybody's list. So it is kind of cool that they're gonna do that. Um, but like I said, the ports are kind of something that I'm getting a little sick of and kind of unfortunate for me because I really don't have much to play on my Switch, unlike other people that have never played the Wii U or anything along those lines. I mean, some of the ports that we see coming are Captain Toad's Tracker, which is a fantastic game, by the way, if you haven't played it. It's just something that we actually predicted funny enough. Um, Let's see. Uh, did they uh, confirm Donkey Kong Tropical Freeze? I, I believe they did. Yeah, they did, but not in this direct. That was uh, yeah, a little while ago. Direct. That's another one that's a fantastic game, but we've already played it. But some of the more interesting things are the third-party ports that already exist on other games, and we'll touch more on that later in this uh, vidcast. But um, Crash Bandicoot, which is obviously a good thing. I can't really um, dog them in any way whatsoever, and I don't want to sound like I'm just ranting on Nintendo because I'm probably the biggest fanboy of theirs at the moment, but as a fanboy, I'm really kind of uh, let down by the number or lack of uh, new things coming to the Switch versus just recycled content from third party and first party content. Yeah, no, I'm kind of with you. I, you know, I'm 
finished up Odyssey. I, I never really got into Zelda, which we've talked about. Um, that's why I said I'm really looking forward to Octopath Traveler because that's new. Uh, you and I both had Wii U's. We both actually kind of enjoyed the system. So I, I've played, you know, we had Mario Kart and Donkey Kong and all those games prior. So, and all these other ports, like you started to touch on there. So, you know, Crash Bandicoot, there's Undertale, there's o Okami, um, Inside, Little Nightmares, you know, all of those. I've already played on other systems, whether it be the Xbox or PlayStation. So they don't really interest me as much. Um, we know we're obviously getting Dark Souls in uh, in May as well. Um, one of the interesting things that uh, I did jump on, and you'll kind of laugh because it was the first Amiibo that I'm ever going to buy, is the Solaire Amiibo for Dark Souls Remastered. Um, it you know went on sale to GameStop exclusive. I believe it sold out really, really quickly. Um, but I have one pre-ordered, and I think that'll probably... I'll say it now. I think it's going to be the only amiibo that I'm going to own, but we'll see. I think there's a shovel knight one on the way to you. Oh so, my uh, lord, that, that might be coming. But yeah, so a return to sender. <laughs> I think that I got the wrong address for this. One. <laughs> um, a little bit of interesting news about that is that it was an online order exclusive only. Um, I did get one as well, but on one of the people I follow on Twitter, who they're they're just amiibo collectors. Um, they try to go to a, their local GameStop and get that as well. No luck. I did the same the following day, and it was an online exclusive order only. So that is going to be probably one of the most sought-after Amiibos, I think. You can never tell with Amiibos because they will, as as Ains joked with me on Mr. Amiibo, but there's some that they will um, release, and it'll be extremely hard to find. They'll be worth a ton, and then they'll reprint them. Um, later on down the road in a larger mass scale with all the stores. So as, as often as you see something like a Toys R Us, a GameStop, or I think even Walmart has exclusive Amiibos sometimes, they only are exclusive for a limited time, and there's literally only a handful that have stayed exclusive. The rest of them have been reprinted. So good and bad there for collectors. Gotcha. Thank you, Mr. Amiibo. Um, <laughs> The only other thing we didn't touch on, uh, you know, for a major uh, first party IP is Splatoon 2. So they announced a uh, first per first person, excuse me, a, a single player expansion for that game, which was kind of a surprise. And I know the Splatoon fans were excited about it. Unfortunately, I, I didn't get into Splatoon. I can't comment too much on it. But I think that is kind of neat that uh, Nintendo is kind of broadening the support for that franchise because it does have a pretty solid following. One of the things I do want to touch on is one of the bigger games that has been kind of on the radar this year is the new Yoshi game. Uh, we still didn't get a firm release date for Yoshi. Um, I think we're still looking at 2018, but we do not have a window even, whether it's going to be the fall, summer, or anything. We might have to wait for E3 to see more on that, but that's kind of one of their bigger games that is coming, as is Kirby. So Kirby is another one of their big games that's coming, too. Those are kind of the big first-party releases after kind of the massive year they had in year one. Yeah, and we did see a little out of Kirby at this direct with Star Allies, but um, yeah, I'm I'm waiting to see the Yoshi game myself. Um, I, I like Yoshi as a character. Um, I really wish, and I was actually talking with some people online about this, is that you know they they announced, or excuse me, they didn't announce, but I saw on uh, I think it was the Reddit Nintendo uh, Switch Reddit that someone found a patent for uh, Donkey Kong Bongos again for the Switch. Oh my gosh! And, yeah, and so you know who knows what's coming there, but. You know, I really wish, uh, and maybe this is just me because Donkey Kong's my favorite uh, Nintendo character, but I really wish they would make a game like Mario Odyssey, you know, in a big 3D open world, but with Donkey Kong and that that kind of, you know, those characters. I think that would be a lot of fun. So hopefully, yeah, one I think day they I'll tried that with the Donkey Kong 64, right? That was kind of a somewhat of an open world, but numerous places you could jump to. Oh gosh, I don't, I don't recall honestly. Yeah, that was a yellow cartridge that was uh, kind of, it's not very hard to find, but at one point it was, and a lot of people wanted it. But that's their only attempt at doing that they didn't do as well. Uh, but, oh, well. Yeah. One can dream. Anyway, we got a whole lot of other news to cover, but that was Nintendo Direct. Like Bert said, we're going to be talking a little more about the Switch and our main topic uh, a little later, but let's move on. So, uh, Call of Duty Black Ops 4, we, we kind of, uh, along with other outlets, talked about the rumor that uh, it was going to be Black Ops 4 this year, a couple weeks ago. We kind of assumed that, knowing that it's Treyarch and uh, Black Ops is the kind of most recognized Call of Duty uh, name or IP at this point. So we have the confirmation. Um, they haven't really shown too much. What they keep saying is forget everything you know. So what that means, I don't know. Um, hopefully it means a little more innovation in the way the, uh, you know, the multiplayer is, the maps, the progression. It, it's been really, really kind of samey 
uh, over the past few years, at least in my opinion. You know, World War II is is really good, and I know we still play it, Bert, um, along with some friends. And, uh, you know, I like it. I like the return to more of the core combat, but uh, it'd be nice to see some uh, kind of different variety out of Black Ops 4. So all they've said in terms of timeline is that it's going to be near future. So... How near, they haven't really said. Um, I, I doubt they'll go back to the full-on jetpacks, everything we saw out of uh, you know Infinite Warfare and Black Ops 3. Um, but we'll see. I don't know. Yeah, I think the date that I've seen circling around it was 2020. Is that, um, am I hearing the right rumor mail or the right uh, talk? But I don't um, know. I don't know. Yeah, 2020 was the, uh, is the date that I've seen circling with the time period the game's going to be in. So, yeah, two years away. Um, but to I me and you were kind of joking about this, and I think we're a little bit Call of duty out. Um, their World War II interested us because it was something different and new and not the same old, same old. Um, at the end of the day, this is kind of a weird thing to say, but all the Call of Duties look awesome in trailers. You see what's coming, you get really excited. And then after about 10 hours of playing multiplayer, it's the same game. Um, there's very th few things that are super different. Um, the calls, the score streaks or kill streaks, depending on what you're playing, kind of turn into the same thing. But um, kind of to the, the main tagline that they're running with, forget what you know. I'm very interested to see what that is, and I'm sure we'll be seeing more here in the near future. Yeah, and of course, the uh, the note, the most notable thing about the announcement was that it's releasing on October 13th, and there has not been a Call of Duty release outside of November this entire generation. In fact, I think someone looked all the way back and found only one Call of Duty title in the past. You know, how many years has it been going now? Uh, 13, 14, something like that. Uh, that was not in November. And of course, you know, this immediately led to us and other people saying, wow, you know, even Call of Duty, the number one franchise in the world, uh, is scared to release after Red Dead Redemption 2, which comes October 27, two weeks later. So found that kind of funny, honestly, just given, um, you know, them being different games. But we've kind of joked before that whenever Red Dead Redemption 2 comes out, every other publisher is going to dive out of the way. And it looks like even Activision is doing that with Call of Duty. Yeah, which is interesting because if you think about it, the, the I think players that are going to buy either one are going to buy either one at launch. But I think Red Dead's going to kind of suck people in for at least a couple of weeks. I can't see people sharing that time with that game with something else. But yeah, I think that's kind of what's happening here. And uh, we'll see. It'd be funny if uh, Red Dead delays again or something weird happens and they're like, dang it, it released <laughs> back when we initially wanted. But, you know, who knows? Yeah, I hope it doesn't. I'm the most anticipated title of the year for sure for me. Um, anyway, so another big uh, sequel announcement here um, that was kind of announced in a strange way, and that's The Division 2. So uh, The Division, uh, most people may not even realize it, but it was one of the best-selling games. I think it was top three. Uh, when it released two years ago, it has had over 20 million players across platforms. It's been a very, very big new franchise for Ubisoft. And <clears throat> similar um, to other Ubisoft games, just as we covered in our main topic uh, last BitCast, funny enough, uh, with For Honor, Rainbow Six Siege, you know, Wildlands, Ubisoft has really just continued to support and expand the game um, in a very, very excellent way. Um, so the division is currently on uh, version 1.8. It it is a completely different game uh, from how you play it, how you kind of interact with the community, how you get gear from when the game launched two years ago. So I actually dove back in this morning for the first time in about gosh probably eight ten months, and even me who has uh, nearly 250 hours into the game uh, was a little lost. I had to kind of figure things out and see what was new, and there's a whole lot of new things to do. So. Um, long story short, they kind of announced this on a state of the game. So they were talking about the updates to the, the Division 1, and they kind of just blurb out that the Division 2 was coming, and we're going to see it at E3. So um, only three months from now, we'll be seeing the sequel, and it's going to be on an updated Snowdrop engine. And uh, that's about all we know about it at this time. But the, all they've said is that, you know, we've learned a lot with the Division 1, and we're going to be able to tell uh, even better stories in Division 2. So... I'm really looking forward to it because I really enjoyed the division. I know you didn't enjoy it as much as me. So what are your thoughts here? Yeah, one of the things that I thought was kind of interesting was the social media response. You had a lot of people that um, have been playing Division 1 for a long time. They've been through it from the beginning um, and have seen all the changes and everything. And they're like, wait, you're going to already kind of abandon the first one without you know adding more content and whatever the case is, even though they've added a ton of content. Um, and then the other uh, 
you know, folks were very excited for Division Two. So I'm only hoping that something actually changes, something evolves with it, something, some of the issues that I've had from the start of it, I have not revisited after all the fixes, so I can't comment too much on that. But didn't dislike the game a lot. It's more of it wasn't what I had expected. And the I did play two months after launch, and I was very let down as to what their final product was. I probably would like it a lot more today. And that's one of the things we've talked about going back to and kind of checking out. So we'll see. I, I think it's a good thing. Um, I was kind of surprised at how much uh, news, um, I guess, headlines it got. A lot of people um, were kind of excited about Call of Duty for about an hour. <laughs> and then, uh, <laughs> you know, Division 2 news comes out, and it steals kind of all the thunder. So. Um, I don't know. I, I, I hope it's good. I, I want to see more of it. I want to see what's different and why there's an actual two versus just kind of, as we talked about in our last BitCast, Games as a Service, I think we kind of had assumed that they would continue adding stuff to part one and then kind of not having a sequel for a while, but this is going to be a new sequel, so we'll see what happens. Maybe it's just a continuation of the story, and the big joke is uh, don't do a Destiny 2. Please don't. <laughs> yes, that's become the running mantra, even among the Division players, for sure. Um for those that played all the way through the Division 1, the story mode, uh, including there's an extra final mission after you beat the game, which is actually very significant um, to the story, uh, you see it was already set up for a sequel. So, uh, you know, I'm one of the few people, a lot of people play that game similar to Destiny and other games where it's just a co-op multiplayer type thing. They love the Dark Zone, they love hunting for gear, and I love all that as well. But the division actually had a really good story, especially if you kind of picked up all the extra things like the phones around the city and kind of tied together all the pieces. Um, but it ended on a really kind of um, almost like a movie, right? It ended on a note where you go up. Oh, well, they're obviously making a part two. So I'm glad that the game has really picked up steam uh, like Siege. It has a really big following and, and dedicated community. And, uh, you know, hopefully they do it right. If they if they screw it up, they're going to there's going to be a. <laughs> A lot of uh, feedback from players, I can tell you that much. Yeah, kind of what happened to the first one. Um, I think that game at one point was the highest selling game of the year it released, and there were so many copies out there. But then if you went to a GameStop or any used store place, there was tons of divisions um, that you could pick up under 20 bucks within you know six months of release. So it was kind of a weird release. Yeah, 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 it was. It was. I think it ended the second best selling game of the year behind Call of Duty, I believe. All right, so... Um, Cool piece of news here is that uh, Hellblade, one of our favorite titles of last year, you know, I did the review on it, loved it. You recently played it, loved it. Uh, it's actually been rated for the Xbox One. So uh, in Taiwan and Australia rating boards, they said that the game has been rated for, you know, we uh, people found that it had been rated for the Xbox One. So this is excellent news. Uh, more people get to play the game from Ninja Theory. It's it's a fantastic uh, experience. You know, it's only six to eight hours long, but it's also only twenty nine ninety nine, and I highly, highly recommend it. So we don't have a, a definitive confirmation from Ninja Theory yet. We don't have a release date, but, uh, you know, with, if it's been rated, it's coming, and we will let you know when it is. I'm just going to say play it. That's all I have to say. Um, it was <laughs> literally one of my favorite games from 2017, even though I played it in 2018. If I had played it in 2017, it would probably break my top three games of 2017. It's that good. The story is amazing. As you get towards the end, you even feel uncomfortable with how some of the things are. And as I've said, it's got the best sound of any game that I've played in years. And um, we'll see what that means for Dolby Atmos on the Xbox One. But uh, wow, if it's coming, if there's maybe enhancements that make it look better than the PlayStation 1, I'll probably play it again because it's so short and, and so fantastic. So we'll see. Yep. So Fortnite, big topic, uh, kind of the biggest topic across the industry right now. It is, uh, it is the hottest game going. It just continues to kind of escalate in popularity, especially among uh, the younger crowd of the industry. They're just loving it to death. And it has overtaken uh, PUBG, League of Legends, you know, the other games as now the most watched game on Twitch and Mixer. So uh, it just continues to kind of rocket ahead. And the fact we talked about it at length before, so I won't go into it. But the fact that it runs well, it has updates for all the different consoles. It's free. You know, the Battle Royale mode is the biggest thing. Um, yeah, it just it just continues to go. Yeah, it's kind of funny because uh, for about two months in the fall, all we kind of talked about with updates and, and news stories was PUBG. <laughs> and I feel like in the last three or four vidcasts, we've talked about Fortnite every single time. So they have made a massive uh, uh, update with, with uh, players and everything, and good for them. I, I hope people are enjoying it. We tend to be more of the PUBG uh, fan base, but um, good for them. I think that's kind of cool that's happening. And yeah, it's it's got every age group kind of uh, interested and 
if you haven't played it, play it and check it out. It's a lot of fun. Yep. So our next comment is going to be about PUBG. <laughs> so PUBG, uh, the um, PUBG Corp released the roadmap for the PC and Xbox versions. Uh, the PC was obviously a little more specific about what's coming because that version has already, you know, been out for a year and a half and a little more ahead of the game developmentally wise. Uh, but we got a roadmap for the Xbox game preview version as well. And the kind of notable things here are uh, beyond Miramar, which is the desert map and the second map, which is coming to Xbox in the spring, they confirmed early spring, they said. Um, they're developing another 8 by 8 kilometer map, so a third full-scale map, um, which will join the roster on the PC side. They're also developing a fourth map, which is going to be half the size of 4 by 4 kilometers. So they think that that will add some variety to the kind of speed of the game, the speed of each round, and the level of intensity with you know more players being in a smaller space from the start. So that's pretty interesting. Uh, they said they're also experimenting with some new game modes. So uh, we don't really know what these are yet. There's a few rumors, but nothing confirmed. Uh, new vehicles are coming and a new 7.62, you know, rifle. So a long range kind of sniper rifle. <clears throat> Excuse me. And they're going to be working as well on individual limb targeting and bullet penetration along with bullet penetration through vehicles. So that's really interesting. And going back to your comment about Fortnite, uh, you know, one of the reasons I do prefer PUBG is it's just sense of realism. I, I, I like the, you know, how realistic that game is in terms of everything you do compared to Fortnite, which is a lot more kind of uh, just cartoony. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with that, but um, I just prefer PUBG in the shooter sense. But it's really interesting if they start, you know, being able to kind of target limbs, arms, legs. And uh, they talked about, you know, being able to zoom in and shoot through a vehicle where it'll go through the, you know, like windshield and kill the driver in one shot with the vehicle still going and things of that nature. So pretty interesting stuff uh, on the PUBG roadmap. By realism, do you mean like looking at your map and then coming back and falling out of the car while you're, <laughs> while you're driving? No, no, that only <laughs> happened once. I just want to be clear. That's right. No, um, I, I, I can't say anything uh, bad about PUBG. I, I love the game so much. We've had a great time with it. I've been playing a lot more of it recently, which is kind of funny because I hesitated at first, but now I, I can't get enough of it. Um, and I just welcome all the changes. I just hope that when they bring the new changes, there's not new glitches like loud footsteps or anything that get kind of silly. But uh, just bring it on. All I can say, I'm hungry for some more chicken dinners. Yeah, one thing they did mention, funny enough about that is, so we've got that hot fix coming to fix those new bugs on the Xbox side. But they did mention that the release schedule is going to be closer to two months going forward because they want to ensure that, one, there's fewer bugs with each release, and two, that there's more meaningful content with each release so i think a two-month release schedule is pretty good if it's actual meaningful releases so that sounds good to me um we did get confirmation this week around uh two of the big first party ips that are coming for both the xbox and the playstation this year and funny enough uh they're right next to each other so state of decay 2 uh for the xbox one and it's play anywhere so it's also on pc and windows 10 is coming on may 22nd and what's interesting about this release is uh, that it's going to be $29.99. So kind of immediately the rumor mill started, you know, kicking up and saying, well, is this game not very good? Is it small? Um, you know, is it not AAA? All these kind of things that were said. But uh, from everything we've seen, IGN has been covering it as part of their first program. It looks to be a very, very deep and broad game, you know, huge world RPG elements. Um, the developer Undead Labs came out yesterday and said that there are no microtransactions in the game because uh, people were thinking maybe it's $29.99, but they're going to you know, be able to buy a whole bunch of things in the game. They said there are zero in the game today, um, and it's supposedly going to offer you know hundreds and hours of gameplay again. So uh, no one really knows why it's $29.99 at this point, but uh, regardless, that's what we're looking at. And then just uh, three days later, Detroit uh, Become Human comes out for the PlayStation 4, uh, and they, um, they've been in the news, Quantic Dream, for not very good things lately, um, which we talked about previously, some of the kind of lawsuits the studio is facing. But in terms of the game, uh, they released some statistics around, um, you know, like how deep and kind of varied it is around the scripts of dialogue and how many characters there are. There's over 500 characters and, um, you know, just uh, books and books worth of dialogue, supposedly. So whether or not that translates to a good game, we'll see. But um, pretty interesting that these two first party releases are coming out uh, three days apart. Yeah, State of Decay 2 did look really cool, first of all, um, in watching their stream and seeing how it played. I'm wondering if a lot of the, or I should say the lower price, maybe because it's maybe multiplayer focused, 
Um, I'm not sure how much of a single player campaign it has or anything, but I've seen that a lot of the multiplayer uh, focus games that are coming out are, are less as far as uh, uh, how much they are. I mean, we saw PUBG, even though that's just a beta or early release, it's not something that's the same thing, but other shooters and stuff like that that have more of a multiplayer aspect, I have seen that they're getting kind of more creative on pricing. That could be it, but I have no idea. I'm not going to assume anything else, but um, you know, I, I'm looking forward to it. It looks really fun. I, I do like that it's going to have that co-op a co aspect. So that looks really cool. The funny thing that I've seen on Detroit Become Human is that is the social media uh, response to how different the game looks as it's getting closer to release than has been sold to us for the past E3s and everything. You gotta keep in mind, this game has been in development for a very long time, multiple years. And um, as we were kind of talking um, offline, you know, it looks like maybe they have sacrificed some of the quality or have kind of degraded some of their quality to get closer to that release date. I'm not sure if maybe they're getting pressure from Sony or what's going on, uh, but this game has been all over the place in the radar for me. I am still on the, I need to wait before this is released. This is not a pre-order game for me personally. Yeah, I'm in the same boat. You know, State of Decay 2 will get to play as part of Xbox Game Pass, which is excellent. Detroit, I, I've said before, I'm 50-50 on. I don't know if I'm going to buy it or not. The fact now that it comes out three days after State of Decay uh, is probably leaning me more towards the not. Um, so if Microsoft planned that, then good on them. But, um, yeah, we'll see. I think Detroit's going to really come down to a lot of reviews and kind of the people I trust, uh, their comments on it. So we'll see what happens there. Yeah. And one more thing I do want to mention about the Detroit become human thing immediately, the Sony only Sony only fanboy sites initially were releasing saying, no, the quality has not been degraded. It's simply a low quality feed. And uh, the, the thing that's interesting about that is I have no idea why Quantic Dream or Sony or whoever released that video would release a low quality feed to the masses, especially with the way social media is today. And when you compare the videos side by side, you can easily see the, the difference in quality as far as detail goes into the characters' faces um, from detail on their face with skin, wrinkles, etc. And that's a story-based game where um, it's almost like a quick time event type deal. So for, if that gets degraded, and I'm saying if, I, we have not seen the final product, um, uh, it'll be kind of a letdown for me. But it is what it is. Yeah, and it'll be interesting, too, to see what the difference is between PS4 Pro and, and standard PS4 as well. So we'll, we'll know soon. Uh, another big leak that happened and uh, we, we thought was pretty cool. We actually put it on our site. Uh, we were one of the first to report on this was that Plants vs. Zombies Garden Warfare 3 has been leaked as well. And this, funny enough, was leaked by a companion book for Garden Warfare 2 that in the description happened to mention that it ties together the story between Garden Warfare 2 and Garden Warfare 3. So um, we don't know. We'll probably see this at EA Play, I would assume, in, uh, you know, in June. Uh, hopefully this comes... Well, I was about to say hopefully it comes out later this year, but you know, with Red Dead coming, who knows? I may not get to it again, but uh, I'm looking forward to see what they do here. We loved Garden Warfare 1. Garden Warfare 2, uh, we didn't get into as much, and I don't know why that was, but I've heard from a lot of people that Garden Warfare 1 was a, a more um, well-tuned game. They tried to do too much with Garden Warfare 2, and it just kind of broke the, the fun formula. So we'll see what happens with this one. The fact that the Garden Warfare series has a story is awesome. That's all I can say. <laughs> uh, it's kind of silly. It's uh, it's kind of funny altogether the way the game plays. The humor in the game still cracks me up. I happen to have spent, uh, I don't know if you do the same, but I have over 90 hours in uh, Garden Warfare 2. So um, I, I played a bit solo, but that game is so much more fun when you play with a group and you're constantly laughing. We always joke that our spouses, significant others, whenever we play the other ones, are probably laughing at us when we're playing because we're talking about corn being shot at us or... <laughs> Um, you know, some kind of a popcorn bomb or something hit us or something. And hearing someone rage at that game has got to be hilarious. <laughs> Sounds like it'd be a good uh, good game for us to stream on with a group. All right. Uh, so one other big announcement. Uh, well, I, we've got two other things. But one big announcement in terms of release dates was that Days Gone, the other uh, new first party IP from Ben Studio for the PlayStation 4, has been confirmed to have been delayed to 2019. Um, given, you know, we don't even have a date for Spider-Man yet. Now that we know that, um, God of War is coming in April and Detroit in May, Spider-Man, if I had to guess, would likely come in the August time frame, maybe early September. Um, but it just makes sense that Days Gone isn't going to come this year because they're not going to release that in October or November, uh, against, you know, the, the major AAA games. So give them, uh, give Ben Studio more time to polish it up and, uh, I guess we'll see it next year. 
Yeah, there, there is a, a placeholder for the end of June for Spider-Man, but um, we still don't know for sure if that's going to come out. Placeholder means kind of almost nothing these days with any any console release, really. But um, Days Gone was one of the three games that I keep joking about, that if I see that another E3 for the third, fourth, fifth year, whatever the case is, it's just going to make me rage. And so I'm raging this year at E3 while we're there. <laughs> I got to hear about Days Gone again. I'm so sick and tired of hearing about that game. Just release already. So. Uh, I, I <clears throat> if they're going to show at least show something significantly different about the world, you know, or what they're working on rather than just showing the same thing. So we'll see. And then uh, lastly, on the news front. So one to comment, of course, I did on the Master Chief collection. Uh, this is a big thing for Xbox and uh, Halo fans. You know, 343 finally coming out and saying we're going to completely rework this title, um, which is a collection of some of the greatest games of all time. I'm going to go ahead and say it. And, um, you know, they came out and gave a, a big update saying that the team is working. They're actually expanding the team. So they're working hard on it. They're going to have a big update next month on it, but they are overhauling the title. Um, you know, it's a, a kind of one step back, two steps forward type of approach where they have to rebuild a lot of things from scratch. They are actually going to overhaul not just like the graphics for the Xbox One X and, and bugs and stuff, but they're also changing the UI in the game. You know, they're basically redeveloping the game. Um, so I thought that was pretty exciting and, uh, you know, I'm excited to hear more about it next month because that, you know, we joked or not joked, but we said previously that if Master Chief Collection was AAA top to bottom, if everything ran well, there were no bugs, it was done right. You know, having all the Halo games in a combined package, especially in the multiplayer sense where you can just play all of them together uh, is absolutely incredible. Yeah, I mean, I hope it's awesome. I mean, especially with the enhancements and the way enhancements have been releasing from Microsoft recently, I, I hope it's fantastic. As we we played the hell out of Master Chief Collection, even in its broken state. So uh, playing that in in non broken state and super polished is going to be awesome. It's going to we're just going to spend another hundred hours in those games. So I, I can't wait to play it. Yeah, hundred in the first couple weeks probably for me, but we'll move on. Um, all right, a couple uh, developer and industry updates to touch on. So Neil Druckmann, um, writer and contributor in most of the big Naughty Dog franchises, uh, including the Uncharted series and and most notably The Last of Us, uh, he was actually just promoted to vice president at Naughty Dog. So this was uh, this was surprising, but uh, really positive news. Neil Druckmann's really good guy. He's a big part of the industry. He's been a mainstay at Naughty Dog for years, and he has worked on some of the uh, you know most influential games of all time. So um, great to see that he's still going to have a huge hand in The Last of Us Part Two, but he also is now a, a bigger player at Naughty Dog itself. Yeah, good to see that Naughty Dog's doing something really, really good as far as their their staff. As as we remember when the Uncharted, the latest Uncharted. We saw a lot of people falling off um, from Naughty Dog and kind of leaving the studio in general. So I, I hope that with him kind of at the helm, that that means maybe people might come back or maybe that means that there's more great stuff coming. I'm always super scared that something negative is going to happen with Last of Us 2. And please don't mess that game up. Please, you'll ruin everything with me in gaming. Um, but uh, I just hope it's good. You know, I, uh, good for him. I think he's done amazing things there. Yeah, yeah, and he's a big proponent for the games industry at large, too. So, you know, seeing him have that VP title, it just, uh, it's good all around from a business sense and for the industry at large. Um, and then a uh, pretty cool piece of news here with Bethesda opening a new studio in your hometown. Um, so Bethesda's opened a new studio in Austin. It's a, uh, a slightly smaller studio. Who knows if they're going to expand it? You know, you never know. Uh, they haven't commented on exactly what franchises or IPs they're going to work on just yet, but Bethesda has a... a you know, quite a few satellite studios that go along. They have talked that, uh, you know, obviously Elder Scrolls 6 is coming at some point in time. Todd Howard's team is working on a new IP as well. Um, you know, it, it, it's safe to assume that Doom 2 is hopefully coming. I really hope that's when we see at E3 this year. So it, we don't know yet if there is, this is a team that's going to work, uh, you know, on a smaller game dedicated or if they're just going to help out on all the big titles. But either way, cool to see uh, Bethesda expanding, especially down there in Austin. Yeah, funny enough, I'm not saying this because I live in Austin, but it's really kind of cool to see a lot of the video game industry is moving to Austin or at least having an office here. Uh, we have Bioware here. We have EA here. I mean, as we have Bethesda here. Um, so we have a lot of big things kind of happening around here. I hope it continues. So it's uh, cool to see. I wonder what game will be here. I mean, Bethesda's been kind of killing it lately on content. So we'll see what happens. 
Yeah, you got to go in there if it's Doom 2. Steal us an early copy, for sure. Yep. <laughs> All right, so uh, we would normally talk about new releases here, and we were kind of going through what uh, you know what people have been playing, and really over the last week or two, there hasn't been anything major. You know, we were going to touch quickly on uh, Moss that came out for PlayStation VR, which has been getting some rave reviews from a VR side. But since neither of us have actually played the game, I didn't want to waste too much time on that. Uh, instead, why don't we just talk about you know what we're seeing out of uh, PSN Plus, Xbox Live Gold, and some of the beta things. So this is a big notable month for PSN Plus. So they kind of combined a bad announcement with uh, a good announcement. So the bad first is that as of next year, uh, I believe it was March 2019, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Bert, um, they're no longer going to offer PlayStation 3 or PlayStation Vita games as part of their PSN Plus offering. And I mean, that kind of makes sense. You know, they're obviously not going to offer those titles forever. Um, as big Vita fans, I'm sad to hear that, but, um, you know, that's okay. But the good news was that in March, the free games on PSN Plus are two excellent, excellent titles. One of them is, you know, considered to be one of the greatest of all time on the PlayStation 4, and that is Bloodborne. Uh, with the other title being Ratchet and Clank. So probably one of the best offerings we've seen in terms of free games on the services for a long time. Yeah, well, let me let me first say, start by saying that Ratchet and Clank is probably one of the best remakes to release on any console this generation, period. Um, it looks like an entirely new game. Um, I guess it is, with it being a remake. But if you, uh, funny enough, I played the Ratchet and Clank uh, back on the, the PlayStation when it was released, and then the PlayStation Vita port, which they kind of updated a few things happened, only like six months before the remake came out. So if you have not played that remake, it feels like a brand new and fresh game. It doesn't feel dated at all, and the graphics are actually fantastic in it. It does have some really good pro enhancements to it, so that's something good. And Blood Bloodborne is in my top five games ever on PlayStation 4. So uh, amazing games. However, you can get both of these pretty cheap as it is, but it's good to be getting them for free in these descriptions. So good for that. Yeah, and Bloodborne, you know, as with most of the Souls games, has a really kind of dedicated hardcore community. So this has kind of revived that community, brought some new players in. So that was definitely cool to see. Um, on the Xbox side, uh, the free... the excuse me, the free games are, are Trials of the Blood Dragon, which is kind of that weird crossover of the Trials game with the, the Blood Dragon thing that Ubisoft did a couple years ago. And then Super Hot is actually coming next week, which is uh, supposedly an excellent game. I haven't played it yet myself, so I'll be checking that out. Um, but most notably that, uh, you know, it's been covered quite a bit is that the final open beta for Sea of Thieves is this weekend. Um, I say final beta, which it happens to be open. So uh, anyone can get in there and try it out. It is Xbox One X Enhanced, which is the first time for the beta. So people are uh, really kind of sharing a bunch of cool screenshots and videos. And it has some new content that wasn't in the previous betas as well. So they're really kind of getting that community going. And, and believe it or not, uh, Sea of Thieves release is only 10 days away as of today. So hard to believe it's almost here. Yeah, one thing I do want to mention is Microsoft has not said anything about them doing away with backwards compatibility and changing their games with gold uh, release of that 360 game. So many times when you see that games with gold 360 title, it's immediately available um, on the Xbox One as backwards compatible. So every time, every month that comes along, there's a new title that's coming through there. So kind of cool that they are sticking to their backwards compatibility, um, I guess, plan uh, for the Xbox One. Yeah. All right, so what we're going to do then is just move on over to our main topic. And ten tonight we're going to talk about um, kind of debating or countering. We're just going to have a back and forth conversation uh, about some of the common misconceptions or statements that you hear often said by, um, you know, different kind of fan bases throughout the industry. So we're just going to tackle two tonight. It's probably going to be something we'll do once in a while. But first up, we're going to talk about the Nintendo Switch. And the Nintendo Switch has gotten a lot of uh, kind of press over its first year. You know, we heard it was the best-selling console for Nintendo in, the, in its first year. It's uh, blown all expectations away. And, of course, it's, um, you know, kind of uh, led the charge on Game of the Year talk between uh, Zelda Breath of the Wild and Mario Odyssey. So it, it definitely had an excellent first year. Sales are continuing to do well. It's blown even the PlayStation 4 sales away in Japan. So Japan's really kind of adopting it as well. Um, and third-party support is really ramping up. So we're seeing, you know, tons of ports, as we mentioned earlier. Um, but that's a good sign because it means third parties in the future will consider the switch or should consider the switch 
uh, when they're initially releasing their titles. So we'll see, you know, we hope that happens. However, uh, what we wanted to kind of kind of debate or counter today is how Nintendo seems to get a pass on a lot of criticism um, that Sony and the PlayStation or especially Microsoft and the Xbox would receive had they uh, taken similar routes or made similar offerings. Um, so, Bert, I, I think one of the things I'll touch on first with the N Nintendo Switch that really kind of gets to me is the UI. Um, so the UI is as bare bones as can be. Uh, it has next to no functionality. Um, there is no kind of, um, you know, real system to navigate through things. There's no apps. It's, it's really just boxes of the games you own and click on it and play it. And it's really that simple. If you think back, I was trying to think back on uh, Xbox or PlayStation and I, I was recalling when the Xbox 360 launched in 2005. Remember the Blades UI? Um, the Blades UI that the Xbox 360 launched with in 2005 had more functionality than the Nintendo Switch's UI, and we're in 2018. And to me, that just seems absolutely absurd. So it, it's one of two things, and I think it's the latter, is that Nintendo did this on purpose, and they wanted to make the Switch as kind of... Uh, lean and mean as it could in terms of the UI, but I think more likely is that the Switch was rushed, um, that they didn't have time to fully develop the UI or the online service, which we'll get to, um, and therefore we ended up with this UI that's on the Switch, which offers next to nothing, especially compared to uh, other modern consoles. Sorry, did you say we're gonna get to the online service? Because they don't have, <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, no, we're, uh... We're still talking about the uh, UI. So yes, um, if we remember actually when the Blades came out, Microsoft got a lot of criticism about the Blades and Sony fanboys, and I guess even some people that were kind of on the fence of what to think about the 360, um, they got made fun of because the Blades were too simple. Uh, the same thing happened with the PlayStation 4 kind of at the beginning because a lot of people forget and people intentionally forget that when the PlayStation 4 first came out, it was very, very bare bones in their UI. And the Xbox One had all kinds of stuff you could do vocally and just simply going through menus. So uh, kind of to the main point of our topic here is Nintendo gets a pass, but Microsoft and Sony, and here we are defending both companies, do not get that pass. And so the big question is why? Um, is it because who their main audience is doesn't care? Or is it because simply since it's Nintendo and they've been kind of lacking the last few generations, all of a sudden they're coming out with very basic items and they're getting the pass because of that. I don't know which one it is. I'm not gonna speak for the fanboys, the people that are just getting into gaming for the first time, because I think that's good. But I think that if Microsoft Xbox One released that console that is currently out, with four main areas, um, <laughs> they would get more criticism that exists today. Yeah, without a doubt. So the, the other thing that really kind of drove us nuts and a lot of people nuts is the way they've handled online. And this goes back generations. But with the Switch, that was supposed to change. You know, they announced the Nintendo Switch kind of online service, a paid service. It was going to include kind of party chat and, you know, kind of at least getting us towards what the other consoles offer. So here we are now, we are just over one year after the uh, Switch launch, one year and one week exactly, actually. And um, we are still another five to six months away from there being any functional online paid service for the Switch. So that's 18 months post-release. It was delayed twice. Um, and here we are a few months out, supposedly, and we still don't know the details exactly what it's going to offer. They keep telling us that, uh, you know, you'll be able to play some old games. Um, it's going to offer parties. You're going to connect through your phone, which don't get me started on. That's just a whole nother mess. Um, but they said, you know, the next announcement is going to blow people away. And here we are, you know, over a year later and we're still waiting. Um, I don't know how this isn't a constant topic. Uh, I know for me, it's a big frustration point with the Switch because we've talked before around how we would play a lot more uh, Mario Kart and and other games together on the Switch if we were able to, uh, with other people that is. You know, you and I can play Mario Kart together one-on-one, -on -one, but we can't play with other people in a party. So um, to kind of add insult to injury there, it launched not only with the bare bones UI and no online service, the virtual console, which players had come to love from the Wii and the Wii U is completely removed. 
So if you've spent money on buying games in Virtual Console and, you know, with any other kind of platform where you buy games digitally, we were just talking about the Xbox, how they've supported backwards compatibility so well. Um, with Nintendo, you're left out. You know, you better have your Wii or Wii U hooked up to play it, but uh, you can't do anything with those on the Switch. Yeah, and not even on the consoles. If we think about Nintendo's highest selling items, it's actually the DS and the different versions of the DS. Um, with that being said, they have the virtual console that still exists today, which is kind of crazy to me that the, uh, the handheld that's been out for a very long time, um, you have a whole new system that is based on being handheld, which is the Switch, and there's no virtual console. The other thing that's very frustrating about Nintendo is their online uh, licensing of every game. Just because you bought something on the Wii, it's not going to be the same license for the Wii U. So when Super Mario World and Mario Kart from the SNES comes out, you're going to have to buy that game maybe the third, fourth, fifth time, depending where you're at. And those people will gladly pay that every single time. Again, can you imagine if the Sony PlayStation 4 or the Xbox One released with no online capability or no cross-play functionality with your friends on that console? It would be the end of the world. Uh, there being an apocalypse, some kind of Armageddon happening right in front of us right now. <laughs> no, I mean, there would. You, you were joking, of course, but there would. It, it would be, the system would not sell. Um, you know, it, it, it would be a mess. And meanwhile, Switch is just continuing to break uh, Nintendo records anyway for sales. So um, we'll continue down this path, though, because we have more. Um, so I heard many people talking about Nintendo's killer lineup for 2017. They had the best lineup, the best games. Um, I've heard several podcasts, many industry people talking about this. And I would just sit there listening to these podcasts in my car while driving or at home, um, just scratching my head. Um, you know, I'm really baffled by this conversation. And I think that people are, are really forgetting the last few years of Nintendo and forgetting what has happened. So let's talk through it, right? So the first big release uh, of the Switch at launch and game of the year, as we've said many, many times on, on many publications, is Zelda Breath of the Wild. However, Zelda Breath of the Wild is a Wii U title. It was always originally developed for the Wii U. It came out on the Wii U, and it just happened to come on the Switch, but it's nearly identical on the Wii U, except for some very, very minor differences. Um, there's you don't factor in and we've had this conversation before remember so for instance like last of us remastered when it came out on the playstation 4 um, many publications everyone across the industry basically agreed that you do not count that title towards the um you know the the counted on the basis of that uh system on the playstation 4 excuse me sorry um because it's just a re-release it already came out on the playstation 3 it's a very similar situation here is that the game it came out at the same time on the wii u but it's a wii u title this was not something you could only get on the switch so when you look at it in that light and you consider that arms was not a, a very big hit you know splatoon 2 originally being developed for the wii u as well the only big unique ip that the switch had in its first year was mario odyssey and when you look back at all the Nintendo consoles, whether it's uh, the NES, the SNES, not the SNES, just going to remind you, uh, <laughs> um, you know, the um, um, Wii with the Galaxy, it didn't launch with it. But, um, you know, the uh, Mario new IP is always a key thing to a Nintendo console. And that's all we saw again on the Switch. Beyond that, there wasn't anything... Um, kind of genre breaking or industry breaking here it really wasn't a revolutionary lineup in any sorts. Sorry, Bert, yeah. went, a, went a little long there. Did you, uh, are you done? <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, so really quick, Mario Odyssey was originally developed for the Wii U. Um, and the reason you can say that is there is no way that game um, was not developed for the Wii U being on when it released. Also, if you think about the games that did release for the Wii U, there wasn't a 3D platforming Mario um, in a traditional sense as Galaxy 1 and 2 was for the Wii that came out on the Wii U. We had Super Mario 3D World, which I guess is kind of a 3D platforming, but not really. It's not their... their uh, big AAA Mario that usually releases. But um, I think what Mario has kind of, Mario, I think what Nintendo has kind of done is they have kind of swept the Wii U under the rug 
And a lot of people didn't even know what the Wii U was. And so Nintendo kind of has, as I kind of joke, they've cannibalized the Wii U and their failure of the Wii U, because a lot of people thought that the Wii U was simply like maybe an expansion to the Wii. Um, and towards the end of the Wii, it was not doing that well anymore. I mean, the Wii had an awesome start, but the, the, at the end of the Wii, software was disappearing. There really wasn't that much first party stuff. But then when the Wii U came out, only hardcore gamers knew what the Wii U was. There's games that have almost outsold on the, on the Switch more than the Wii U sold in multiple years in its first year of release. So if we think about the four biggest selling games for the Switch, they're all Wii U games. And um, some of those we've played already. And if you think about third party stuff that has come out in that first year, it's really kind of unfortunate because we're not seeing anything new. And if you are a hardcore gamer that has to play all, all games when they come out that are fantastic, you're not really getting anything new outside of Zelda and Mario. Uh, we've already played Mario Kart when that was out on the Wii U. We played it to death um, in, and then some. Splatoon 2 has been seen as more of an expansion uh, versus a new game. Uh, Splatoon 2 can run and has been seen running on the Wii U before. So it's not really a new complete experience. If you look at the other high-selling games for 2017 for the Switch that are not first party, you look at more of like Doom. Um, you look at other games that have come out. I think Payday is a 2018 release, but it's still something that is... Skyrim's another one. Yeah, Skyrim. Uh, oh, oh, don't get me started on Skyrim. Um, <laughs> I, I figured I'd throw that out there for you. Uh, how long ago did Skyrim release? Are we at Six seven, years. seven year mark if, by the seven time years, we get yeah. to that release. Um, that makes no sense to me. Hey, but hey, you can get Link Armor in it. You can get Link Armor in the Switch version. So you're you're good to go now. So um, yeah, Nintendo has cashed in on their mistake of the Wii U. And if you're not a hardcore gamer, you never played the Wii U. So this is all new to you. I think it's unfortunate for us that did play and still love our Wii U. Mine's sitting right kind of there. You can kind of see the screen. Um, but I love the Wii U. I had still played it. I still play it for social nights. We still play Smash, Mario Kart, all that stuff. Um, but as a Switch um, adopter, you can kind of see my library right here. I have five games. <laughs> and the, uh, the fifth game that I bought is the best game that is a new title that is an original title outside of the Wii U ports, and that is the Mario Rabbids Kingdom, which I think is fantastic. So yeah. Yeah, great I'm, game, I'm off my rant. <laughs> no, that's the point here is that we're just trying to be realistic. You know, I want to be clear that we don't hate the Switch. We both own it. We both own games for it. We both take it with us when we travel. We both like it. But again, we're talking about the things that Nintendo gets a pass on that other companies would not. And I think your point hit the nail on the head is that Nintendo realizes the Wii U was a was dead. It was it was like a flop. Um, so they have kind of swept it under the rug and they're just bringing anything forward to the switch because it's such a big hit that they know a lot of those switch owners never who, who never bought a Wii U will now play because it's on the switch. Um, and that's a shame for people like us, as you said. So, but wait, we're still not done. There's other things. Um, we kind of touched on the ports and I'll let you go a little further on those because you know, uh, you know, the detail about them more than I do. Um, but the, the technical issues are all the, always the things that drive me crazy from a platform perspective. And if you recall, when the Switch launched, actually still today, there are no cloud saves. There's no way to get your data from a game off of the Switch. Um, and when it initially launched, that meant that if you had a technical issue with your Switch, they couldn't even transfer your data off of it. You had to send your Switch in, get a new one, and you there were people losing you know, 80, 100, 120 hour saves in Zelda um, because they had a hardware issue. And that's just unacceptable. That makes absolutely no sense in 2018 or 2017. Um, and then some of the accessories as well. If you think about the accessories for the Switch, and I know there's some uh, kind of unique technology in them, um, but they're not advanced to that point. But, you know, just to me, maybe it's me. You can tell me if I'm crazy, but $80 for two Joy-Cons, which are, you know, this big, um, it's kind of crazy to me. The fact that they sell a piece of plastic and call it the dock for $90 at retail um, is absurd to me. Could you imagine if, if you know, Sony or Xbox came out and said, here, you can plug your PlayStation or Xbox into this on a different TV, but it'll cost you $90. I mean, they would be ridden over the coals. It doesn't even make any sense. Um, so just, again, just more stuff that Nintendo has done with the Switch that is selling like crazy and gets defended in some circles um, that make no sense to, to me or us. 
Yeah, I've actually seen big Nintendo fans that have a dock upstairs and downstairs, and they gladly play, paid that $90, um, and they're happy about that. If you think about it, $90 is almost a third of the console purchase price, which doesn't make any sense to me. And the dock is incredibly simple. It is literally a piece of plastic that holds an HDMI port and a, uh, what is a USB? Power. And it's yeah, a, USB type power C. and HDMI. Yep. Yeah, it's a USB Type C port, and that's it. There's literally nothing else. There's been people that have actually hacked this, and they have their own thing because the original uh, actual cradle was scratching the screen, so they created a, another way to do that where you don't have to do that. Um, and uh, ninety dollars for that bad boy. Uh, <laughs> we went on a uh, vacation to Arizona, and I brought a normal Type C cable, thinking that that would be able to power my switch um, and an HDMI out that would be able to connect to a TV. And because I didn't have a Nintendo AC adapter to connect to that dock, it didn't work. So I had to actually go out, buy a um, Nintendo AC adapter at a store over there um, when we were away for $35. The Nintendo AC adapter is $35. <laughs> so yeah, I think you've kind of emphasized the point here, but the, the point being is that it's it just kind of absurd. There's a lot of aspects of the Switch, um, and we'll, we'll close out on the Switch on this, um, that just don't make a lot of sense. And Nintendo is taking advantage of the Nintendo fan base and people who are kind of fascinated by the Switch hardware, it feels like anyway, and that's a shame. Um, so anyway, uh, you know, depending on what you think of the Switch, we know we have um, fans who don't like the Switch, and don't you know, follow Nintendo, and we have uh, fans that love Nintendo and love everything about the Switch. So you can let us know your thoughts if we're being unreasonable or or if you have a counterpoint. So, but hey, the, really uh, quick, um, yeah. I just want to mention one thing. Uh, I do want to mention that we are huge, massive Nintendo fans, and I think that's actually why we're upset. <laughs> so we're not Microsoft fanboys, we're not Sony fanboys, and we're just hating on Nintendo because of that. But I think we love Nintendo so much that we were wanting more original content that wasn't initially for the Switch for the Wii U, and that's what makes us a little frustrated about that. So don't make this seem like we are, or I don't want you to think that we're making this seem like we hate Nintendo. I mean, we bought all their stuff. It's currently sitting on our shelves. I have two AC adapters. <laughs> I heard you spent $35 on that. Is that true? <laughs> All right. So the, <laughs> so the, uh, the second kind of misconception or, you know, thing that is said that we're going to kind of debate or counter today is the mantra that Xbox has no games. And this was perpetuated starting about uh, early last year when PlayStation 4 kind of hit its stride in some exclusive titles, not necessarily first-party titles, and that's a good distinction to make. Um, so Horizon Zero Dawn, we've talked about at length, love it to death, um, fantastic game, first-party title. But things like, uh, you know, Nier Automata, um, Hellblade, and Persona 5, just three, and Neo, so four quick examples came out. Um, not first party studios for the PlayStation 4. They just happened to come out early last year. PlayStation 4 had an excellent 2017, especially early on. And so that kind of led the fanboy bases or the, you know, the people we don't like to associate with too much in that regard, um, to this mantra of Xbox has no games. And it didn't help, of course, that Xbox in 2017 had one of the weaker first party lineup schedules, which is Halo Wars 2, Cuphead, and a few others. Um, However, we have talked at length about this topic before, um, and in fact, Bert himself has done a lot of research into this topic and whether or not it really holds any water when you dive into it. So, Bert, I'm going to let you kick this one off because you are well more more well versed on the playtime among first party titles compared to third party titles uh, because you've done a video and article on it. Yeah, so um, I did an article, gosh, this, uh, back in maybe June of last year, as to are exclusives really the thing that sells a, um, a console, and also is it something that actually is the highest selling piece of software, period, on any of the consoles. So the only console that can really state that is Nintendo. And the reason, as, as we were just railing on them, uh, Nintendo has got all their games, and the most games that are sold and people buy it for is the Nintendo games. Until recently, third party has not been a big thing. But sticking on the Microsoft and Sony fanboy war that has been going super strong this generation, 
Um, Sony didn't really have a ton of exclusives until really late in 2016, early 2017 is when all the exclusives came out. I did a ton of research on not only uh, game scores as to the quality of the exclusives that released, but also what has sold the most in the actual overall sales categories of the Xbox One and the PlayStation 4. And it's very interesting to find out that exclusives don't even break into the top 20 sold games for the Sony PlayStation 4. So if you are a Sony PlayStation 4 owner and that's all you've bought, and you're railing that your exclusives are what sells the console and that's where it's at, your games aren't even in the top 20 of games sold if you are that adopter, with the exception of two. And so that's kind of, kind of a weird thing there. Uncharted was one of them at the time. Another one that gets a pass in our book is The Last of Us port or the remaster of it is not really a new game this generation, so it's not really counted in the running. But when you look at the overall game scores that are released across Metacritic and Open Critic, Microsoft actually had the higher score by over seven points of exclusives since the start of this generation. It wasn't until 2017 where Sony killed it. And I think we can all admit that Sony killed it in 2017, that the exclusives really came out in that year. But you have to look at when Sony, PlayStation 4, and Microsoft Xbox One released and look at it in general. So it's really hard to kind of say that. If anything, Sony was really lacking in the exclusives department. And unfortunately, Sony has kind of fanned this massively as to this is where all the exclusives are found. A lot of people get kind of tricked into the advertising of numerous games. I have personal friends that are not hardcore gamers that thought Call of Duty and Destiny were exclusive to the Sony PlayStation 4 because of the advertising rights that they had and the way they were able to release DLC ahead of time. So um, it's kind of unfortunate. I think a lot of unfortunate. I think a lot of the messaging that Sony does is very um, kind of they misinform their their crowd a lot, and it makes it really hard for Microsoft to kind of uh, do what they do with their titles as well. And you can't really blame anyone else but Microsoft at the start of the generation with the way their messaging was released in a very confusing manner. Thankfully, Phil Spencer is there now, and he's doing a great job with where the console is going. But she's still. Um, and if you want your head to blow up, do not look at social media at all when it comes to fanboy wars. It's like looking at politics in 2018. It is horrendous to kind of look at where there's misinformation and facts. There are still people claiming that the Microsoft Xbox One has to always be on and you can't buy used games for it in 2018. <laughs> it's unbelievable how those rumors perpetuate. Um... But yeah, and I think uh, there's a couple other points here too. As, as you noted, third-party titles uh, are usually by far the best-selling uh, across both platforms worldwide. So you look at FIFA, you look at Call of Duty, you look at Battlefield, um, Grand Theft Auto V, Minecraft. These are games that are on each platform. They are the highest-selling games on each platform, and they have the most played games on each platform. Um so far and away, the majority of people play games that you can get on either platform. Um, the only exclusive recently that's broken into you know the higher sales numbers is Horizon Zero Dawn, but that's really the only one. The rest of them fall far behind um, you know the third party titles that you said. So the other thing to comment on here is, um, and some other people have pointed this out, and it's really about preference. You know, for us, we play all of them, so it doesn't doesn't really matter, but if you look at the PlayStation 4 exclusives and what they offer, so if you think of their big titles, let's just stick to the big titles. So the Uncharted series, um, Infamous, and God of War is you know being rebooted here shortly. Um, uh, what's one I'm forgetting here? Uh, I think I'm forgetting one, but anyway, our Horizon Zero Dawn, we'll just throw that in there. Killzone? Um, Killzone's fantastic. Don't... don't, don't. <laughs> Uh, the old Halo killer, right? Yeah, right. Um, anyway, th those titles, fantastic games. Last of Us, you know, one of my fa top three favorite games of all time. Um, Horizon Zero Dawn, fantastic game. One of my top games of last year. Uncharted, one of my favorite series. So these are all fantastic, fantastic games. I will take nothing away from them. Um, however, when you look at the amount of play time that each title offers its consumer, there's a huge difference. So Sony focuses more on the first party, um, first party, excuse me. Um, third person. Yeah, third person and uh, story driven, you know, titles, which is great. Uh, Microsoft, on the other hand, if you look at their major titles, whether it be Halo, uh, Gears of War, um, you know, Forza Motors Motorsport, one of the biggest franchises, and then even their things they're bringing this year with State of Decay 2 and Crackdown 3, 
Sea of Thieves. These are all games that have, well, Sea of Thieves, no, but they all have a single player component. And there is a long, you know, story going in Gears of War and Halo. Um, however, the majority of playtime is spent in multiplayer, whether it be competitive multiplayer or co-op multiplayer. Those titles offer hundreds and hundreds and for some people, even thousands of hours of playtime. Um, I think we were just looking yesterday and I have something like 500 some hours in Halo 5. Um, and I think I have maybe 20 hours in the campaign. So that just goes to show you. Um, and I think there's something to be said for that. You know, people will say, you know, well, we've got Last of Us and Uncharted on the PlayStation side. And I would never want to take those experiences away because they're some of my favorite of all time. But if I had to take one on a desert island somewhere, I'm taking Halo or Gears all day long because that's a game I can just continue to play. It continues to get updated. And, um, you know, it just offers that experience that the others don't. Um, and I know some of you may be thinking Uncharted and Last of Us do have multiplayer and they do. They're small communities. They're not they're not on the same level of something, you know, like Halo or, or you know, even Forza in that regard. They're just not the, the same, even though they are well done, because I enjoy I actually wrote an article on Uncharted for multiplayer, but I digress. Um, but anyway, the point is, is that they, if you look at the amount of playtime that you can get out of these titles, um, there's a, a very stark difference. And I think that should be pointed out as well. Yeah, something else that I found in my research back, and keep in mind, this was in the middle of 2017, so we're now we're almost in the middle of 2018, which is nuts, but um, when you look at exclusives, um, the two big titles that it broke in, and, and uh, Horizon Zero Dawn wasn't that in, uh, into the overall numbers yet, it was Uncharted 4, and uh, Horizon Zero Dawn jumped in as the game steam throughout the year. But if you look at each console owner, the average Xbox One owner owns more exclusives than the average PlayStation owner. And this is once again average. If you're the hardcore gamer, you're going to have all the exclusives, all that stuff. But the average gamer, as we're mentioning, plays cross-platform titles. Your, your Maddens, your FIFAs, your Call of Duties, your Battlefields, all that stuff. And then every once in a while, they will play something else. Like... Um, I think, uh, funny enough, I had a buddy that only plays Gran Turismo. Um, and I asked him, hey, have you played the new Uncharted or The Last of Us? And he's like, what is that? So um, just be careful when you get into those conversations of this is where Sony has all their things and uh, Microsoft doesn't. Um, I think if you kind of go back to Sony uh, and you were to ask the average gamer, who is the main mascot for, for Sony PlayStation? Um, I don't think they would have an answer for you. Whereas if you go to Microsoft and go, who's the main Microsoft mascot? You immediately know it's Halo Master Chief. So um, kind of, it, we're not in that mascot world as much as we were back in the Super Nintendo and Genesis days and Sonic and Mario and stuff like that. But it's still kind of important that if you're a huge Microsoft person, or even if you don't know Microsoft Xbox One stuff, the overall crowd knows um, who's, who's the exclusive people that people are really into in the games of the big titles. Yeah, and so, you know, another another point here I just want to make before we close out this topic is that uh, I, I don't think personally that Microsoft has gotten enough credit outside of the Microsoft crowd for what they've done over the past couple of years for gaming at large and for the platform as well. So when you hear things like Xbox has no games, you know, we just touched on kind of the exclusives and the big titles, but microsoft more than any other company especially more than nintendo which we talked about is giving you more ways to play the xbox games uh, across all generations and more ways to play the games you already own by far um, than either playstation or the switch so if you think about things like uh, xbox 360 backwards compatibility right the xbox 360 was a hugely popular system many people owned it owned a ton of games for it there are now over 400 games um, that are supported on the xbox one and if you have an xbox one x a lot of those run better than they ever did well they run better than they ever did on the xbox one but they're even further enhanced uh you know we just saw four more major titles enhanced for the xbox one x recently um on top of that they have original xbox backwards compatibility so i think there's 13 or 14 titles that play on uh the xbox one now which means you know technically we're going back uh 17 years worth of games that you can play on a single platform now um, and then you offer things like EA Access and uh, Xbox Game Pass as well. So subscription offerings that, you know, give you free games, um, Xbox Game Pass. We've touched on both at length. But again, it's just hundreds of more games or at least 150 more games between the two that you can play across two generations. Uh, 
and you know put as much time as you want into them so there are a lot more options to play the games you already own and from different generations as well on the xbox and i don't think uh, people are really giving them enough credit for that because it, it really is excellent and they continue to expand it um, and it just continues to get better. And in the backwards compatibility sense, it's completely free. You don't have to do anything. You just take the game off your shelf and play it, which is uh, incredible. Yeah, I think that's, and I think that's what the point you're making is, you know, people need to kind of realize that Microsoft, a lot of the things that they're doing doesn't make them any money whatsoever. Uh, if you have that original Xbox game or that original 360 game, you literally put it in your console and it works. Um, there's not, you know, Microsoft's not making a penny off you for doing that. So um, a lot of things that they're doing for the actual gamers is, I think, really, really cool. I think it's really hard to argue that PlayStation Plus is better than Xbox Live. I don't know if you can even have that argument because of the money that Microsoft puts into Xbox Live to make it a really good online service. So um, that's something that I think should be kind of, uh, you know, something big for them to kind of be congratulated on. I think it's something that they work really hard on. Yeah, for sure. Um so just to close this out, I was going to say that, you know, we obviously, our old site's built around playing everything and we always talk about everything. And so at the start of that, you know, this whole Xbox has no games mantra, which is nonsense. Um, the benefit of being a gamer who plays everything. I was commenting on how a lot of the Xbox uh, first party titles give you that multiplayer component where you can play for hundreds of hours. And a lot of the Sony first party titles give you that single player narrative experience. Um, the best part, right, is own them all. If you have the means, of course, but if you play them all, you get the best of both worlds, and it is the best way uh, to do it, quite frankly. So anyway, anything else uh, you want to touch on before we just kind of close those that topic out? Yeah, on them all, just like Pokemon, you got to catch them all. But yeah, I think the competition is really big um, and, and important between the two. I mean, we've both seen Sony kind of challenge Microsoft and Microsoft challenge Sony into the, the way they do things and the way games are releasing. I think Sony's even looking at better ways of doing their online services. If we remember, like I joke um, about the PlayStation 4 when it first released, it is entirely different now than it used to be at launch. And I, I think that if Microsoft didn't exist and it was just Sony out there, um, I don't think Sony would have done a lot of the enhancements and things that they've done to get better um, throughout the last few years that they've been out. So just keep in mind, the fanboy stuff is fun back and forth and the banter is back and forth. But if it was only Sony or only Microsoft, um, it would be a very boring world when it comes to games. Um, so just keep in mind, competition's got to be there in order for things to get better. Yep, for sure. All right, so that's closing our main topic. Let's talk about some collectibles, some old games, have some fun here. So um, collectibles, um, I think I'm going to touch on Burt, right? So just a few things I picked up this week. Uh, as you can kind of see behind me here, the Funko branded plushes for Cuphead came out. And because I'm such a sucker for Cuphead, um, I picked these up. I actually already have the Cuphead and Mugman plushes that came out from the Yeti.com uh, several months ago. These are a little different, uh, and of course, you can see I picked up the Devil as well. I also got uh, some of the Funko Pop Cupheads, and I was able to secure, which is nice, uh, the Spring Convention exclusive, which is uh, Cagney Carnation, um, which is uh, you know one of the early bosses in the game. So this was pretty cool to find as well. Um, but I also wanted to touch on you know talking about uh, Sony and the history there. So as you can see here, if you're not familiar with what this is, this is a launch us edition playstation 2 and um you know i sold a lot of my older consoles which makes me cry every time i think about it and all the stuff i sold off so i'm slowly picking them all back up and i kind of wait until i can find one that's what i would consider in mint condition so that's the console itself the box all of the inserts and manuals and everything that goes along with it and i was able to find this uh seller that had this playstation 2 in excellent condition as you can see the box still has its gloss it's in perfect condition so uh the console is actually in there i didn't want to take it out and everything but uh pretty excited to grab that this week as well yeah i've been kind of lacking in the collectibles department i really haven't picked up a lot of stuff i have a lot of things on order that's coming soon but one thing that i did pick up after watching a fantastic review by i believe it goes by porsche power online I sounds like an the, idiot yeah the nacon <laughs> yeah <laughs> nacon revolution pro controller for the playstation 4 
kind of excited to get into it. I, uh, I, I'm not really playing that much on the PlayStation 4 at this moment. I actually just finished another game and then jumping back into the PlayStation 4 game that I was working on. But it's going to take some adjusting. I've gotten so used to the PlayStation 4 controller that I'm looking forward to doing that. Um, and then something else that's some fantastic news that I'm currently negotiating on. I'm negotiating on a Yua? Awa? Yua console? What's that bad boy? Um, someone, someone posted one on Craigslist. <laughs> I want 30 for it. I threw he wants 30 for it? it? He wants 30 for it. I threw 15 bucks at him. Oh, my um, God. We'll see what happens. But it does have two controllers, <laughs> and it would be awesome to have on my uh, shelf just because I think it's a <laughs> hilarious story. You know, but I hope I picked that up. I was just going to say, we, we laugh about that stuff now because they were on clearance at Target for like 20 bucks. I remember just stacks of them. Um, but 20 years from now, you know, we do, which is a long way, of course. But there's so many consoles, small one-off consoles like that from the uh, 90s and stuff that people just didn't buy that are worth so much money now. Like, I was going through some, like, uh, for instance, the um, TurboGrafx-16 handheld. Mm -hmm. You know, so I had the TurboGrafx-16, of course. Um, never bought the handheld. Go ahead and look up what the TurboGrafx-16 handheld is in, in a box in mint condition. You're paying several hundred dollars for that thing now just because it's rare and, and people want it. Um, so I joke with you, but I'm telling you, if you can get it, I would get it and sock it away because it would be a cool thing to look back on, you know, 10, 20 years from now. Um, yeah, the one that, uh, one more comment on this, the one that makes me the saddest, which I always joke with Bert about is the, uh, Neo Geo. Um, not as rare. There's plenty of Japanese ones out there, but I had a Neo Geo US edition in the box. Uh, you know, mint condition and everything. Those go for usually above a thousand nowadays, along with some of the games I had that go for a few thousand dollars each. Um, so it makes me cry every time I think that uh, I sold those off. But anyway, all right. Um, we want to move on to your favorite section if you'd like to lead us in. The season reflections are back. Um, all right. So that was ridiculous, but <laughs> my uh, season reflection for this week is Luigi's Mansion. As we were talking about the love for Nintendo, I figured I would just lay more down on everybody. Um, Luigi's Mansion is one of my favorite games for the GameCube, and I believe it was a launch title. I can't remember correctly. It was. It was right around launch, if not launch. And I thought it was fantastic. A lot of people didn't get it. They're like, what the heck is this? Um, it's literally Luigi as a Ghostbuster, pretty much. And it is still playable, and it still holds up, damn it. Um, I played it on the Wii uh, through the enhanced feature since I can't afford the uh, component cables for the GameCube. And it's just a lot of fun. Uh, Luigi is a really likable character, even during Mario Kart when he's just rolling on people. Um, but it's, it's a lot of fun. If you haven't played it, check it out. It's really the only place you can play it is on the GameCube. If you have a GameCube or if you have a Wii, uh, you can play it on the Wii uh, through, I guess, the backwards compatibility, even though the Wii is pretty much a GameCube with motion controls but um check it out a lot of fun yeah it is a great game i was one of the few who loved it as well i know a lot of people at the time were mad that we didn't get the uh you know the mario 3d game to launch with the gamecube but i love luigi's mansion i thought it was a blast so uh my game is uh you know i th i thought in honor of picking up the playstation 2 here i would go back to one of the classics that defined it and actually now looking back has obviously defined gaming uh the industry and that is grand theft auto 3 um when this came out um and then we've said this about a few of the titles that we've talked about but this game was a uh industry changer it led the conversation around, you know, where games were going. It led the conversation about game violence and led to meetings in Congress and hearings about uh, video games, which I cannot believe we have to talk about again in 2018. Um, that's another topic. But Grand Theft Auto 3 was the definition of revolutionary. Um, when I played it for the first time, even being a big gamer at the time, my buddy actually got it before me. I played it at his house for about half an hour one day. I drove to, uh, I think it was Electronics Boutique, on the way back to my house, picked up a copy, and uh, you know, I think I sat there the whole rest of the night playing it. But it, it's the game that led the way for Vice City and San Andreas, and now, of course, what we know as Grand Theft Auto V. Um, revolutionary title. And one funny thing here, so this, uh, the gentleman who sent me the PlayStation 2 sent me this as well. I got a few games with the PS2. I only just realized, not only, like I said, everything's in mint condition, so it has the whole map in here. You remember when we used to have the map of the city, Bert, and the, the full color manual? 
Um, yeah, those are which, fantastic, man. Which is excellent. But on top of that, look at this. Dang, eight megabytes. Eight megabyte memory card. So we'll see uh, what is on this thing once I hook it up. But it'd be kind of funny if I have his old game saves from Grand Theft Auto 3 and the other titles on there. So it's pretty... funny. I, I booted up my PS2 probably about six months ago to kind of test a couple games that I received from some friends. And the memory card menu is hilarious. There's like a, like an icon of a, that specific uh, game and then it like moves and hopefully your memory card still works because some of those have gone bad over time but uh, yeah that's playstation 2 was just amazing back in the day and um i had a friend come over to play grand theft auto 3 he's like ah, i'm not really into it he ended up playing till 3 a.m not exaggerating <laughs> just driving around town kind of getting the cops the, i guess the stars yeah um, to escalate and then he got like a tank through a code and was playing and blowing people away so fantastic game and you're right that changed the entire industry so rockstar yeah. are doing it again yep and i i hope that's what we're looking at with red dead redemption 2 later this year so all right well thank you for joining us for episode 21 uh it's been a uh interesting conversation with some of the topics we had tonight but a lot of good news across the industry this past week week and a half um, a lot of great things in 2018 um i did want to comment on a few things before we close out so we um you know, have done game reviews. I, I feel the quality of our reviews are really high, which is excellent. But we also um, do not have the time to cover everything we do and to publish these reviews on a, as regular of a basis as like the major outlets and some people who just focus on reviews do. So with that in mind, on our site, we have a reviews page, which has our reviews out there. We're going to be modifying that a little bit to kind of highlight the new releases as they come out. And then instead of, uh, you know, trying to review each game, which is impossible for us specifically, we're actually going to um, kind of give you the uh, the highlights from Open Critic and some sites on the games. And then if we're playing that game, we may give you kind of a little rundown of what we think about it. Not a full review, but just some comments some things to look out for. Um, anything you may need to know about the title that hasn't been mentioned. So we think that format will be more appropriate for our audience. And uh, kind of laying that out now, getting the plans going, and uh, you'll see that in the near future. Um, other than that, I thank you as always for tuning in. Um, you know, thank you very much to our listeners across SoundCloud and our third party apps and iTunes. Uh, are really, really appreciate it. I know I can't say that enough. Um, we are talking about our plans. Bert and I are uh, have our condo reserved and flights booked and scheduled for E3 this year, which we're really pumped about. So we're going to be talking about our plans for that in the near future. And then, Bert, I know we were talking about some uh, streaming community nights as well, right? Yeah, so we've talked about uh, maybe picking some games that we can play with our community. We usually communicate that through our Facebook page. So if you're not a member of our Facebook page, just take a look for us. It's a Season Gaming. We'll probably have some polls up there for uh, not only some of the older games that just to play with people, but also some of our newer games that are coming out to where we'll simply say, hey, on Wednesday night, we're going to be playing this game. Come join us or play with us, something like that. But we're pretty much going to be experimenting with it. Um, and then we're also experimenting a bit with our streaming. Uh, like I mentioned, and I believe the last bit guest, we have been streaming on, uh, I believe, Tuesday nights with uh, some games. We're kind of struggling on producing that in a uh, good content for you on a YouTube or anything like that because we can only get one stream at a time. And usually streamers stream their own selves, and that's really it. When you're streaming two different screens and seeing all the craziness that can happen on that live stream, it's kind of hard to put that together, especially when you're streaming for over an hour. So we'll have something kind of up there for you. We're looking at some other content that we're going to be working on as well. So we'll have some announcements when we've kind of uh, ironed all the details for those out. So hopefully we'll have some new content for you, not only on YouTube, but also vocally as well. So thanks for listening in Dan's points. Can't tell you how much we appreciate you guys listening in or watching on YouTube or any of these streaming sites as well. Yep. Thanks again, and we'll see you online.